Welcome to the Pursuit of Learning podcast. I'm your host, Clint Murphy. My goal is for each of us to grow personally, professionally, and financially one conversation at a time. To do that, we will have conversations with subject matter experts across a variety of modalities. My job as your host will be to dig out those golden nuggets of wisdom that will facilitate our growth. Join me on this pursuit. Moms have a lot on their plates. It's even more challenging for millennial moms who have social media showing them all the things that they're supposed to be doing or that they're getting wrong. Something that often falls to the wayside is money and financial literacy. That's why today I wanted to talk to Catherine Alford about her book, Mom's Got Money, which seeks to address this challenge. I had an absolute blast having this conversation with Catherine. She and I are very aligned on a lot of things, money and financial independence, and I think that comes across in our conversation. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Catherine, welcome to the Pursuit of Learning podcast. Can we start our conversation with a question I ask all my guests? What's motivating you in life right now? And what are two to three things that you want to ensure we get across to the listeners in our conversation today? I am super motivated by all of the mom who I haven't reached yet, who I haven't helped yet. There's millions of them out there. And every day when I wake up to work, I think of everyone who hasn't heard my message yet. And that is what motivates me to keep going. Um, Today, as far as takeaways, This book that we're going to be talking about today, it's a personal finance book, but it's also a personal development book. And I wrote it specifically for mothers. And I hope that everyone who's listening today leaves extremely motivated and that they understand that they have a lot of skills and talents and power within them to improve their lives and their their finances. That is a great point. There's a lot of actionable takeaways in the book, and we'll dive into a lot of that. And then part of that is providing people with tools that they that are much simpler than I think they may believe and giving them a bit of an education around how those tools work. So we'll definitely do that in the conversation, Catherine. Now, given that, the second question may be obvious, but when you wrote Mom's Got Money, what was your motivation And I'm assuming the target demographic was mothers everywhere, as you just mentioned. But do you want to dive into what your demographic was and why you wrote it? Well, I'm really glad you asked this question because this book, this book journey, it, it did not come easily. Like you see a lot of people who are in similar jobs to me, influencers, like in media, you know, all of these different partnerships with banks and all of these things. And they seem to get book deals really easily. That did not happen for me. It took me uh, four and a half years, 28 rejections, two different literary agents. And I was very committed to writing to the millennial moms specifically. There's 9 million of us. And there were many opportunities along the way to write it for all women or to make it broader. I had one publisher that was like, we'll do it. You know, we'll publish the book. If you go back, edit your, you know, 90 page proposal and make it for all women. And, you know, in some of my low moments, I was like, okay, I'll try. And then it ended up not working out. And looking back at the journey, I think everything was pointing me to now and all the little roadblocks along the way were helping me to make sure that I stuck to my original goal of millennial moms. Lots of reasons for that. Obviously, I am a millennial mom. I have seven-year-old twins. I'm 34 years old. So like I'm writing to people like me. But millennials are in this really unique situation right now where, you know, our parents are getting older, our kids are getting older, but all of us are still kind of saddled with a lot of student loan debt. Um, you know, I graduated in 2009 from college in the recession, and you know, a lot of mothers had a lot of difficulty this past year with the pandemic, with the mental load, the workload, leaving the workforce in droves. And I just think that millennial moms are in this really unique sort of high pressure position where 
they can kind of fall victim to everything that's going on in the world, or they can sort of take charge of their own lives and make sure that the decisions they make now for their lives, for their money, helps them in the future and helps their families. There is a lot to chew on there, and we're going to cover a fair amount of it early on. One of the things I heard was emotional labor. We're going to talk about that. Uh, We're going to talk about student debt, credit card debt, high interest debt throughout the conversation. You also talked about the perseverance and the rejection that came with trying to get published. One of the things that jumps out at me is a lot of our listeners are looking to grow personally, professionally, and financially. One of the biggest things that contributes to that is simply not giving up on what you're doing. So, right, it's consistency plus time gets you the results. So, Catherine, how did you maintain that mindset of not giving up in the face of all that rejection along the way? Yeah, Clint, I am stubborn AF. Like, I am just... Actually, our family motto is Alfords don't quit. Like we can pause, we can pause, we can rest, we can take a moment, but like we get back in there. And my husband is super resilient too. And I listen to a lot of personal development podcasts. I'm very, very deep into, you know, our thoughts determine our feelings which determine our actions, which determine our results. So I'm like very pro like mental strength, mental health. And I listened to a podcast. I think it was Chris Harder's For the Love of Money. And he had an entrepreneur on there who I think owned a gym. So literally nothing to do with what I had to do. But he was trying to get a loan for the gym. And I think the 53rd bank approved him. He just kept going to all these different banks. He was Australian, I think. And he said something on that podcast. And I was kind of like in the depths of this journey and just mad. You know? And he said, if you knew that the 53rd bank was going to say yes, then one through 52, it wouldn't matter because you would know that it was coming. So you would just go through the motions. You'd go to all the meetings, be like, yep, no, 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 rejection, rejection. So when I heard that, I think I was on, who knows, rejection 10, 12. And I thought, like, somebody is my yes. I just don't know what number it is. I won't find out. I don't know how long it's going to take me to find out. But someone is going to say yes to me. Like, I have all the right things. It's just a matter of finding the right person or the right person finding me. And then I would look up how many rejections did insert famous author get? And like, I would find things like Chicken Soup for the Soul got a hundred rejections. Like publishers thought that idea was stupid. It's like, it's Chicken Soup for the Soul, people. You know, I mean, even, you know, Harry Potter, you know, one of the greatest writers of all time. I think she got like, I don't know, 18 or something. I'm like, fine, you know, that's JK. Maybe mine's, you know, quadruple that, you know? But I just, I was very committed to getting this word out and I just, I just kept going one after the other <laughs> until someone said yes. So I love that. And for our listeners, just keep going after it. Don't give up on your dreams because you hear no once or twice, 30 times, 40 times. Just keep pursuing it. Maybe you need to pivot somewhere along the way. Maybe you need to take a rest. But... And accept the feedback too, you know, I mean, I accept, like I said, I switched literary agents. The second agent had a ton of feedback, kind of ripped it apart, put it back together. And then that's what eventually did it. So sometimes you might have to switch your, your coach, your team, your, the advice you're getting, but just be, don't be so stubborn that you don't want to like change it or be open to feedback. And remember the family motto. Modify it a little. Quitters never win or winners never quit. Alfred's don't quit. I love it. I'm going to have to work on that with uh, with the boys. So when someone picks up your book, if it's a mom, if it's not a mom, because there's a lot of actionable advice for everyone, there actually is a lot of actionable advice for all women or men, who young men who are reading it, because there's a lot of things in there that they won't know how to do, or, or and we'll talk through those. What do you want them to take away from the book and how do you want it to influence their lives? Well, I've always said like, I hope that this book 
is the first of many. I don't claim to have all the answers with personal finance, but I wanted to write a book that was engaging and interesting and personable that made someone get excited about money and want to read more. Like if it's on the shelf, like I want three more next to it afterwards because you got so jazzed up and realized it's not as hard as you think. And you went and grabbed like a couple other authors who you might like too. But I think like the, you know, again, this is about resilience. And I I talk a lot in the book about how it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how wrong you've gotten it in the past. You know, like today's the day to start. Here's some small ways to start. And I try to break it down to these little bite-sized stuff. Like, look, like we're not expecting perfection. Like we're not expecting people to be investing geniuses next week. We're not expecting people to um, have the most perfect budget or like the best relationship with your spouse where all of a sudden you agree on every single like money thing. You know, like this is not a miracle book, but this is a book about taking personal responsibility and sort of injecting that motivation into people to realize like, wait a second, I can do that. Or I can learn anything. Like I have this big chart in the book about, you know, some mindset shifts and, you know, some thoughts that you can use to replace the negative thoughts you have about money. So if it's like, I'm terrible with money, you just replace it with, I can learn about money. (laughs) You know, (laughs) even if you replace it with a neutral thought, we don't have to jump all the way to, I'm a money genius. We can just do that middle step. And I think people just expect these huge results immediately. But this is this is a lifetime of learning and process. So I hope the book just jumpstarts that for a lot of people. And you had a very good point right there that I really want to emphasize at the, at the end. A lot of people overestimate what they can do in a very short period of time and underestimate what they can do over longer periods of time. A lot of the things that you're teaching and writing about money, as simple as they are, you need to do them for a consistent period of time before you really see the great results, which I think we'll talk about as we go throughout, which then ties into not giving up when when you hit those initial early roadblocks or you're learning because it will it will come in the fullness of time. So you talk about mindset and you highlight early in the book two key things that I'd love to take our listeners through. You talked about scarcity mindset. I also just maybe three, because I just heard when you were talking and you were talking about the fact that people could learn and they can grow in these areas, it highlights a growth mindset for me. So we've got scarcity, growth mindset. And you also talked about a concept that my wife started bringing up to me more recently, which is emotional labor. And I think that's a very important one for our listeners to understand. Can you take us through those three concepts and then we can talk about how scarcity mindset and emotional labor combine negatively as it relates to money? Sure. Well, when you have a scarcity mindset, you believe that money is hard. You believe that, you know, it's hard to get or there's all kinds of people out there who just want to screw you out of your money. And a lot of that comes from childhood. And, you know, even people who grew up in like wealthy families, they have their own versions of like negative ideas about money that come out. So it doesn't matter how you grew up. We all learn certain things about money for better or for worse. But for a lot of people, it's scarcity mindset. And like, how do you find out if you have it? Well, if a guy in a Ferrari like zooms past you and like cuts you off. Are you just like, Oh, what a jerk in that Ferrari. (laughs) Or like, you know, that's, you know, rude, rich guy. Or if you're like driving down the neighborhood, I remember one of my readers, I talked about this and she wrote me back and she said, you know, I really need to watch what I say in front of my kids because my husband and I drive through this really nice neighborhood and there's these gorgeous houses, And we always kind of joke like, Oh, I bet they're drug dealers since they have a house like that. And she's like, you know, it's a joke, but like, is it a joke? And, you know, when you're driving through a neighborhood, you like, what would you tell your kids and how do you respond to them? And all of the energy and the thoughts and the words that you put out there about money make up your mindset and whether it is scarce or, or growth and how do you tip? And every time you tip or give, you send signals to your brain. Do I have enough or do I not have enough? And I kind of feel like I like abundance because 
it's crazy. And I spent my last chapter of the book talking about this. I can't explain it, but every time I give, it comes back to me somehow. Or every time that, you know, I'm relaxed about money or I give a little bit more than I felt comfortable, it always like seems to work out. Or I get this like mystery check in the mail because like I overspent, you know, at this place or with this bill and I got a refund. It's like the weirdest things happen. But when I'm stressed about money, because I definitely go through phases and when I'm like, oh man, all these big things are due in the same month and I feel very like scarce and tight. It seems like that's the month that like the dryer breaks. And like that's, it's, I can't explain it. It's so woo woo. But when I'm in abundance and when I'm in a giving mood and when it's like things just work out, it's the strangest thing. And look, I've been through plenty of periods where stuff is not working out. <laughs> so that's how I try to stay. And if I notice like little things happening or breaking or things pop up, I kind of have to check myself. Like, how was I feeling about money? How was I feeling about work and my clients and my money coming? Like, am I freaked out right now or am I feeling good? And I don't know, it matters when it comes to money. I don't know if I'm like, I mean, I could talk about this for like three hours straight. You highlighted there for the listeners, if they didn't catch it, scarcity mindset, you just generally always feel like there's not enough, whether it's resources, money, whatever it is, you have a mindset that just says, I have to get mine and protect it and keep it from others. And the opposite of that, the cat just highlighted was an abundant mindset. So abundance, you just, you believe there's more than enough of whatever it is for everyone in the world. And if someone else wins, you're, it's one of the downsides of a scarcity mindset. You're often unhappy when friends or other people win because they just got something that you can't have now. Whereas with an abundant mindset, you can cheer on people when they win and get a big raise because you know there's still enough to go around and yours is just around the corner. So scarcity versus abundance is a wonderful topic to spend hours and hours on. Absolutely agreed. But we'll have to cover more of the book, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. It's one of my favorite things to talk about and teach, really it is. But it's hard in practice, for sure. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's good to teach the kids, too. And, and we'll talk a bit about what we should teach our kids later. And so emotional labor. Yeah. I, I mean, if I could define emotional labor, this is a phrase that is um, becoming increasingly popular. Um, there was one article about it in Harper's Bazaar, I think in 2018. And she really started it, then she wrote a book. And now it's something that's being talked about a ton, especially in terms of the pandemic. If I could just like break it down to like the easiest terms, I'm going to talk about scheduling a haircut. When my husband wants a haircut, he calls and he schedules his haircut. When I want to get a haircut, I got to think about five things. <laughs> I'm like, what am I doing that day? Will I have my kids with me? Should I get a babysitter so I can enjoy my haircut? You know, like, you know, how did I put that in my budget? You know, should I ask my husband, like, can he, is, is he going to be around that Saturday to like watch the kids? Or like, do I need to take time off work and block that out of my schedule? And there's like, there's so much that goes into me scheduling my haircut. It's, a, it's remarkable that he can just schedule a haircut. <laughs> It's just like wild, but it's not something that my husband, Jonathan did on purpose. Like he's not trying to make his haircut scheduling easier than mine. This is the result of generations of societal and cultural growth that's happened. We have, um, Women are maintaining a lot of the same responsibilities they did a hundred years ago. And, but we are working a lot more in the workforce now, even stay at home moms. I talk about it a lot. I mean, one of the things I encourage stay at home moms to do in my book is to like get a babysitter sometimes, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, if you had a job, you would have vacation days. So like, this is your job and it's so hard. Like you should budget in a babysitter. I think it's just all the worry and the weight of thousands of decisions that women, but more specifically moms have to make every day. Like, and it's something that happens naturally. Clint. It's like, why am I the one scheduling the parent-teacher conferences? I don't know. No one told me that that was my job or that I had to. It's just you take on these like responsibilities for whatever reason. And uh, we're really bad at outsourcing moms. We like to do it all. 
We like to, uh, we like other people to think we're doing a good job. We like to, you know, think we're superheroes until we like crumble. <laughs> And then like, we really need help. We leave it till it's like an emergency. <laughs> so yes, mental load is a huge thing. And one of the things I said in the book is that I know that money is a huge worry for a lot of people, a lot of moms, because we're responsible for, we're probably the ones doing back to school shopping and making sure that the kids are scheduled for their like well visit and their flu shots and their this and their that and their sports. Like I was, I spent a lot of the time yesterday, like looking for tennis classes for my son. I don't know. No one told me that was my job, but somehow I acquired it and decided it was my job. I don't want money to be, to add to the mental load. Like I cannot fix all the rest of our mental load problems, but money is something that can be automated and planned and organized so that it doesn't take up. If it's like keeping people up at night, that can be something to take off their plate. The And how would you say, because it, you mentioned millennial moms versus moms in general, we're right on the border. I think they call us exennials. We're right between millennial and, and Gen X. It's like a three-year group. So we're... Did you have a cell phone in high school? <laughs> no, that was the key. So if that's the breaker, we grew up analog, but we were digital from college on. So we, we get a bit of the best of both worlds. But my wife, and I see it, Social media contributes horribly to emotional labor for mothers because every birthday has to be Pinterest or Instagram worthy. And I'm going to have to do all the cool things that the kids see in their TikTok videos. So none of that seems to help. And the major one you brought up is the kids and the schedules. I think that's the one that really just for my wife takes up a ton of brain power is figuring out camps and sports. And if you don't register on the exact minute, you miss that camp. So the like outlook is apparently full of warnings and triggers. I miss memos all the time. Like, it's like, how did y'all all schedule camps already? Why are people asking me in February about summer camps? I'm like, was I supposed to do that already? I can't, like, I didn't get the newsletter, you know? It's like, how do you know this stuff? <laughs> it's like, exactly. You know because you miss one year and you're like, oh. Right. And you're like, shoot. <laughs> okay, okay. Next, next year, I've got to be on it. Absolutely. And so a big thing you want to focus on is if we can make your money easy, because you already have a big stress load. So if we can make your finances easy, it's going to make your life easy easier and take some um, um, mental load off? Absolutely. And I mean, I outline exactly how I personally manage my money in the book. And I try to teach people this message. It's very hard for people to take on because I manage my money one month ahead. I do that on purpose. So I don't have to think about it. But what that requires is you have to have all of your money for the month on the first of the month. And I've been teaching it this way for years. And I've been trying to just help people just get one week ahead and then two more weeks ahead. It's really hard. So then I realized, you know, I really have to inject this idea of motivation and like your why and your reason to like help people get over that hump. Because what I do is everything is automated in my life. All of my bills, everything. I just make sure all the money is there on the first and I let it all come out and then it fills back up and then I just go on and on because I don't like to think about everything. I, I, I monitor it. I make sure the amounts are right or that someone didn't mess it up. But that is kind of the method that I teach. And to me, having tried a bunch of different things and cash envelopes and this, I mean, uh, I've been doing this you know, job for 11 years. So I've tried like all the things, all the apps, and like, this is just what works for me. And so I, I share that in the book. And I also kind of teach people like how to get that one month ahead. It's, it's basically like, you know, three or four months of like super focus to like build up, build it up. And so, but you don't have to be in like pain forever or do a side job forever or be super frugal forever. It's just to get to that point. And once you do, you can really breathe at night. Um, it won't keep you up at night when you know it's just all happening for you. You just reminded me of something, and I'll share an example with you that mentally was breaking me. I'd taken a new job, and at the time I was going to be a controller for a company. And 
the person who was in the role before me was still there. And so they were showing me what they do each day. And this company had hundreds of entities. And one of the things the person would do each day is update the daily cash flow daily. So that was fun. He would just open that up and he would go through every one of those hundred entry entities and he would just sort of look at the entity and be like, all right, what's coming up today? What's coming up this week? What's going to happen in the next seven days? Hmm. And then he would just like key in a bunch of stuff. And I was just looking at him thinking to myself, you do this every day for like three hours and it's all from memory. Like this is ridiculous. So like I just sat down with him over the course of the week and said, Hey, can we just put together a little list by entity? What are the things that happen every single month? Can we just put when they happen, what day? And then I can just kind of use some lookup formulas to go grab that information. So I never ever have to have that. Have to spend three hours. Oh my God. It was so mentally stressful. It was, if I had to do that, I would have lasted about a week in that job. (laughs) You're like, nope, today was enough. (laughs) That's enough. Yeah. So it was all about how do we automate this so that to your point, the finances are automated. That's done. Now I can focus on the bigger pieces. I can focus on the budgeting and the cash flows. And we're going to get all into all of these topics as we continue our conversation. But we're still early in the book. And at this stage, you talked about it a little earlier with the affirmation statements. One of the concepts you talk about is developing a boss mom mindset. So what is a boss mom mindset? And how do our listeners change to a boss mom mindset? Yeah, I think that, you know, and this is all connected to our conversation about mental load and all of that stuff. So I think, you know, sometimes when people follow me, they they think I kind of like have it all together or I never have a day where I'm overwhelmed. And it's like, oh, no, like I've got yeah plenty of days where like the kids totally break me or like the job breaks me. But for me, the boss mom mindset is a leadership mindset. And I do not think a lot of moms view themselves as leaders. I, you know, a lot of us are like, gosh, no one knows how much we do. And it's like, I don't think you know how much you do. I don't think you realize like what a valuable leader you are in your family, because we kind of think of it as like the mom with like formula on her shirt and like, like we can't like get all the way ready. And like, we're so hard on ourselves. And it's like, no, like you are the boss of this family. Everything would fall apart without you. And so I try to get moms to recognize that they have all of the skills and the talents within them to be amazing at anything they want to be, at anything they want to succeed at, simply because of the fact that they're a mother. And everything that they have to manage on a day-to-day basis and hold on to and everything that they worry about, the boss mom mindset is not waiting for other people to do things for you. I, I mean, I feel like I tell my kids every other night, like, look, I'm not a waitress, all right? Like, stop asking me for water and stuff. Like, you're seven, you have two arms and two legs, you know? So I feel like, but the day-to-day grind of that, you kind of are like, yeah, I'm kind of a waitress. Like my, all I need to do in this life is to give people snacks. But you know, when you sit down and you really think about it, you're like, you are making some of the biggest decisions for your family, whether you're a single mom or in a relationship, even something as little as camp, like we're talking about every choice you make goes into your child's development, their memories of their childhood, their interests, Everything that makes them into who they are, these are not little decisions. You're raising human beings. And I, the boss mom mindset is taking it from the victim mindset, the scarce mindset of why does everyone keep piling on me? Why is no one helping me to, of course, people are giving me tasks because I am the boss of this family. I am the leader. And I am the best person to get this job done. 
And the thing about leaders is leaders have outsourcing ability. They delegate. And so the next step to that is you recognize you're a leader. Well, how do leaders act? How do CEOs of companies act? You have your own tiny little army of like snack wonders, you know, like you are in charge of them. How do you outsource? I just think moms think they have to do so much on their own. So again, with the money thing, I outsource it to all the banks who are automatically deducting from my checking account. You know, it doesn't have to be people. I mean, as we're doing this podcast, I have a lovely woman who's cleaning my house as we are having this podcast. It took me so long to admit that I could actually put that in my budget and that it was okay for me to have that help. But there, you know, there was a time where I like would not allow myself and I felt like it was my job to have everything perfect all the time. Um, so that is the boss mom mindset, wherever you're starting. Um, and you know, in my book, like I, I had some very low financial moments I discuss in the book, wherever you're starting, it's just about being a leader, recognizing your own abilities, recognizing how much you do, giving yourself some credit, and then, you know, working to improve your situation little by little. And you can be in a vastly different place a year from now. It's such a great takeaway in there is that if you are able to do all of these things that a mother does on a daily basis, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, you are capable of so much more than you probably realize. Yeah, like how long do moms research car seats? Like how how many hours does a mom spend, you know, learning what kind of food or like what's that weird rash or like how many, you know, schools did you maybe look at or daycares or whatever? All of that means that you have the ability to learn something new and to research and money is just like another topic to learn about. And that's why I wrote this book. So it wasn't like some boring Wall Street dude with big terms trying to act fancy teaching them. And it's like, hey, yeah, this time my babysitter didn't show up and my kids were screaming at the top of their lungs while I was trying to work on this super important call. Like been there. Also, let's talk about babysitting and outsourcing and like, you know, child care. You know, so I tried to write a book that like it would be relatable to other moms and that they could see that this is just something else they learn. They're learning every single day and kids bring us us unique challenges every day. And you read and you learn and you ask for advice or you try a couple things. And this is the same thing with money. It's just a new thing. Let's start diving into some of the money concepts then. The first one you talk about is a very important one is a person's or a family's net worth. Do you want to share with our listeners what is net worth and why is it important? What are some of the key things you look at? And this maybe we'll say for the uh, next question. What are some of the key things you look at when you're looking at someone's net worth for the first time if you were coaching them? Well, your net worth are your assets minus your liability. So your assets are things like your house, the money in your checking account, the cash you have in your sock drawer, your, and some people include their cars in that, your retirement accounts, um, any other brokerage accounts. Your assets are all the things that, you know, you own and have in your life. Your liabilities are all of the things that you owe in your life. So that'd be your mortgage, that would be your balance on your car, that'd be your pesky student loans, that would be the money that you owe your dad because he bailed you out two years ago and you've been paying him back slowly. You know, all of those things are your liabilities. So you take all your assets, you subtract all your liabilities, and you're left with your net worth. I feel like net worth isn't really talked about that much. I feel like, again, I really wanted to elevate this conversation for moms. All of the personal finance content for moms is like, hey, girl, like, don't forget to click your coupons on the way to the grocery. And I'm like, no, moms are intelligent leaders, and they can handle more than their grocery coupons. So I put this net worth chapter before the budget chapter because I wanted people to know where they start. Too many people are are focusing on the day-to-day, the paycheck-to-paycheck the money stress of like not having enough in the month itself. Net worth gives you just this broad view. How am I doing? And it allows you to 
kind of write down some goals. I even say in the book, look, if your net worth like looks terrible and is a big negative number, you are going to have the coolest chart 10 years from now. Like imagine like how awesome your line is going to look like super boring to start out with like $3 million. Like let's start out with some negatives, baby, and like watch it go and track it every month. And so I just try to tell you, it doesn't matter where you start, but the net worth is important because uh, not because it makes you who you are or it counts towards your self-worth, but this is your legacy as a person. This is your family's legacy for how you want to live your life, how you want to retire, your level of generosity. And it's good to set a net worth goal and some benchmarks and work towards that. Absolutely powerful what you were saying there. And in our family, I can share that net worth is predominantly all I focus on. So I project out 10 to 20 years and set some pretty reasonable goals while still being uh, audacious on, on what we're going to achieve as a family. And my responsibility in our family, and you talk about this later, is who's responsible for what when we have our family uh, finance meetings, I'm focused almost exclusively on growing the net worth. And usually that talks about the top line and the investments. And my wife generally focuses on the cash flow. And so she manages the cash with an iron fist. Uh, and, and I just say, okay, well, where are things going to get us to where we want to go? And, and then she makes sure that everything shows up. And so net worth, I think the more people focus on it, the more they're going to get to where they want to go. And that's a key concept. What gets measured gets managed. So if you're not looking at it, how do you change it? Okay. And so what are some of your key considerations? Because I, I love in the book that you go through different scenarios and you say, hey, this is person A's scenario. This is person B's scenario. Here's some, th some takeaways that they should be focusing on. What are some of the big ones that you want to highlight right off the bat that people should be paying attention to on their net worth? Well, I think that, you know, you brought up the great point of the investments and making sure that you have investments and making sure that you understand your investments. And, you know, I think that's such a scary thing for a lot of people coming in. Um, this goes back to like, you know, you can learn anything, you can read a couple books and know more than like 99% of the population about investing. And I encourage people to focus on that because, I, again, I think people get too bogged down in the day-to-day -day and they don't think about the future. And investing is one of those things that you really do have to start. You don't have to, but it's the most beneficial for you to start as early as possible and to pay attention to that as early as possible. And a lot of the things that stress people out, like debt or you know, their student loans, if they have investments and their investments are going well and, you know, they're pouring all of their money into that, everyone has a different way of doing things, but it might alleviate some of the stress of like, well, I have these student loans, but the payment is this, but look how well my investments are doing. And even though I made like a $500 student loan payment, I made my investments increase by $2,000 last month. So I'm going to focus on that. It just gives people this extra knowledge layer. Um, again, we're thinking long term. We're thinking big. Like we're going big. And I start every budget meeting with um, a, a goals, a declaration of goals and fa individual and family goals. And one of the things I say in the book is like your goal should be super embarrassing to tell other people. Like they should be so big. Like you would not want to bring it out at the park when all the parents are hanging out together because they would think like, Wow, like <laughs> I don't know if this person's crazy or they're stuck up or whatever. Um, and then you know, once you think your goals are like super big and audacious, then you kind of erase them and then you go bigger and more embarrassing with them. And I like to start the budget meetings like that, you know, because it reminds us that we're on the same team. <clears throat> and um, then you go from your goals to your net worth, and you're like, okay. What, where do I want to be to achieve all those like crazy goals that we just said that were too embarrassed to tell anyone? Where, what numbers do we need to be at? And then I go into like the monthly budget because then it doesn't really matter so much. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to fight with you 
over like how much to put in the dining out budget because we just saw where we want to be and like that's way more important than like getting sushi or going out one more time and so i like to start it that way because again it kind of it makes it like a team thing it makes it 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 alleviates any like nitpicky stress because we're not worried about we're not super worried about the tiny granular problems that come up month to month because we're focused on the net worth. Um, yeah, I, I kind of did a little baby intro to investing in the book. Um, but again, you know, you asked me the main goal and the, my main goal is that this is the first of many books. Like I hope it pushes people to go to that next step because that, as you know, like that's the way to, to build wealth. You can't like save your way in a savings account to, multimillionaire status you have to invest yeah the and one of the keys to that is the power of compounding i don't know if you have an easy way to demonstrate to the listeners usually it's through an excel spreadsheet to to demonstrate the power of compounding but do, do you have an easy way to to get across what the power of compounding is verbally yeah i mean and like you said, we can do a spreadsheet, you, you know, you can, there's a, a lot of compounding calculators, but, you know, essentially you earn interest on your investment. So let's say your $1 turns into a dollar and 10 cents this month or something. Well, instead of earning interest on just your dollar the next month, now you're earning interest on your dollar and 10 cents. And it just goes from there. But that times a lot more dollars times a lot more years is pretty remarkable over time. And again, speaking of automating, you don't have to be super active with it either. Like as long as you uh, sort of know what you're doing, you can you can go real conservative with it, you can get really into it and get hyper aggressive with it. I just tend to chill like I invest in index funds which is kind of just broad conservative I explain index funds a little bit in the book. I kind of compared it to like a really nice um, dinner delivery service. Like your index fund is not one of those food, like dinner deliveries that make you chop all your vegetables like before, like, you know, that whatever, you know, <laughs> hello fresh and all of that. It's like, we're gonna make dinner easier now, chop all this stuff, no. Index funds are like the really nice ones that come already in the pan. They already chopped it for you. They put it all in the pan. It's all together and you just put it in the oven. You don't have to think about it because it's it's all diversified. Everyone can pick out the veggies. You know, they can leave some, some veggies can be rotten, but like overall, it's like a super easy package done for you way to invest. It's recommended by all the best investors in the world, even Warren Buffett, you know, the 10 year bet where he, uh, Warren Buffett, I think he, what did he bet a uh, hedge fund manager? Yeah, that um, just a simple, basic, like total market index fund could beat the hedge fund active guy. And it, and it did. And Warren Buffett's a guy that invests in companies. Like he, his investing style is to own pieces of companies, which is like a totally different thing. But he's always said, to your basic like normal average investor you can't go wrong with it so um people can consult the cfp on this you can read a lot about it but all that to say what i think what we're both trying to say is that it's not as intimidating or as difficult as people will think and it should be a very prominent part of you learning about money management because just learning about budgeting and self-control and all of that is not going to get you to having a wealthy family and we're all, I, I personally am always like pro becoming a wealthy family because I believe the more money you have, the more good you can do in the world. So I've kind of released any blocks about wealthy people are bad or evil or any of that. And that's just one of my thought processes. I'm absolutely aligned with you on that because it also gives you the freedom to pursue your, your life's purpose. And if we're all pursuing our purpose and, and have the financial wherewithal to do it, then we hopefully are making the world a better place. Uh, a quick analogy to give the listeners or a metaphor um, that I use sometimes for the power of compounding is if you think about a, a little train in the engine at the front, 
when you first start investing and you're putting the coal, these are very old trains, into the fire, the train's just moving nice and slow. And the more you put the coal in consistently with time, the train just starts speeding up bit by bit. And over the course of years of investing, the train starts to go full speed. And now you have one of those trains like in the TV shows, Snowpiercer, where the train's running around the world nonstop and it's unstoppable because effectively, once compounding gets to a certain point, you're making as much money from your investments as you used to be contributing. And when you get to that point, it's a wonderful place to be, and that's where your family will truly start to see your wealth grow over time. And you can keep it as simple as possible, as you're saying, Kat. The other thing you said just before we talked about that was you talked about the family budget meetings, which are one of the things you say you need to have. And before we get into what the family budget meetings are, because you say before you do that, and you highlighted it, was the concept of personal and familial goals. So you you talked about setting them audaciously and then making them even more audacious. I loved that. How does a person come up with their goals? How do they know what is my goal personally? What is my goal for my family? I think that you sit down and you can sit down in a quiet moment and you give yourself permission to write down like the biggest dreams you've ever had privately. As a kid, when you passed by, when you went to your friend's house and they lived in a mansion, when you watched a documentary about Iceland and you you secretly always wanted to go there but never told anyone, all of the things that maybe you were afraid to say because you were afraid your parents were like, that's not a good idea or that's a waste of money. All the things that you have ever hoped for in your life you finally take the time to write them down and allow yourself to imagine a world where you actually get to do those things on your list. And so then you're building your budget to allow you to achieve those dreams. And that way it doesn't feel like your budget is this like mean control freak that doesn't let you have any fun. Your budget is now the method that allows you to check off the first box. And so once we have those goals, we want to set up a family budget meeting. So that brings two questions up. Many of our listeners may not actually know what a budget is. So we've talked about net worth. What is a budget? And then number two, why a family meeting? And a question for you, when you do family budgeting, are the twins involved? Mm, Good question. Um, I, so what is a budget? A budget is your spending plan for, well, I do it for the month. I mean, you could set up the whole year, but um, I like to go month to month and it's, you write down your income and then you write down all of your bills and goals and you try to make a plan that you can stay within for the month. And it gives you a little bit of guidance, a little bit of discipline um, to make sure that you avoid going into debt or further debt. Uh, budgets can help you get out of debt. Budgets are a way to just pay attention to the money that you have. It, if you've never done one before, it can be a little shocking at first. If you go back and maybe look at your last two to three months of spending, you know, you might be like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that my late night Instagram habit of purchasing things was that bad, you know, or really Target truly is $100 every time we go. Wow, it really is the case. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't go there. (laughs) So, you know, you kind of like go and you look and it's, it's amazing what you find out. I always encourage people to look at their past spending with compassion, like talk to yourself as though you were sitting down with your closest friend. Like you would not be like, Oh my God, I can't believe you got Starbucks that much. Like that is so irresponsible. Like that's how we talk to ourselves. So you could talk to yourselves like, you know, girl, I hope you enjoyed all those coffees because we're not going to be doing that this month uh, because my credit card is now this and I'm going to fix that in the next two months. And so, yeah, a budget is you, you sit down, you organize it. 
challenging part if you share your life with someone and you share your finances with someone is that you kind of both have to agree on how the month is going to go. And in the book, I tell people, you know, you don't have to join your finances if you don't want to. This is like a departure from some of my earlier messaging when I first started being a financial writer and financial educator. I used to encourage everyone, you have to join your finances with your spouse. But as my life went on and I started meeting more people, I realized there's a lot of situations where it makes sense for people to have separate, you know, women who were in previous relationships, women who had um, a lot of financial abuse from like former spouses. There's a lot of situations that make sense, but you can still have a budget meeting. You can still say, you're responsible for this. I'm responsible for that. Here's 50% of the rent. I'm writing you, I'm sending you a Venmo, writing you a check uh, during this meeting. Um, so you can do it either way, but it's just an open discussion with your other half. You ask me if our twins are involved. No, that's a good idea. Twins know a lot about budgets and money and, you know, buying things and they, you know, earn their money. But the budget meetings are usually happen after they go to bed. So we don't get interrupted because it's really hard to finish a sentence any day. Uh, so these are like important sentences. So we try to do them when they're asleep, actually. And we do it once a month. Some people do weekly just. Once a month is pretty much, you know, it's good for us. But yeah, they don't always go super smoothly. Sometimes wine helps, a little bit of wine with your budget meeting. Um, and like I said, starting with the goals helps too. But you sit down, you, you write down your expenses. If you've never done one before, it might take you a couple tries to write it out. You kind of monitor things as they go. I look at my bank accounts every day. Um, I see what's coming out and... Um, yeah, you just try not to go over. I pretty much go over in food every month, forever and forever more. And sometimes I'm like, you know what, this month I'm going to increase my my grocery budget because I'm just going to accommodate the fact that I keep going over. And then I like, decide to invite. Yeah, then I decide like, you know, we should have like friends over for like brunch on Sunday. And I'm going to go buy bagels and like <laughs> champagne for mimosas. And I'm like, why did I do that? <laughs> so over my new number. So, but I don't want to like sound, oh, that's so easy and like privileged that you can go over it. Cause I had many budget meetings where I had my little cash envelope uh, when we were first married and I had like $40 left and I was going to the grocery store and there was like, you know, a couple of days left in the month. And I was like, all right, we're going to do, we're going to go old school. We're going to go like French onion soup. We're going to go red beans and rice. So I've definitely like experienced all of the budgeting moments over the last uh two decades i don't know how long i've been budgeting i've been budgeting a long time you know since i was probably like 2021 20, so the one of our past guests had one of my favorite lines on budgeting because a lot of people don't enjoy it right because they think it tells them they can't do something and his line was a budget doesn't tell you that you can't spend money it tells you how to spend your money so when you start to think of it that way it gets a little less intimidating and could be a great tool in your life. One of the areas that you write about, and I'm a very big proponent on this one, is eliminating high interest debt as a priority. Why is that so important? And what are some of the tips and tricks you recommend to your readers, to the listeners, on how to eliminate high interest debt? It's important for a lot of reasons. One is that it causes a lot of people and a lot of families a significant amount of pain and mental load and sleepless nights. And it causes people a lot of problems. And I, it can be super hard to get out of. And the other reason why it's so important is you and I just got finished talking about net worth and compound interest and, you know, adding coal to our coal train. That happens with credit card debt in the wrong direction and faster. You know, we're talking about building net worth by investing. And, you know, you and I are like hoping to get eight to 10 percent a year, you know, every year. And that would be like super cool for us. We're talking about a train that's going twice as fast in the wrong direction, you know, 20, 25 percent, and it's killing people and it's putting them further into debt. And then it ruins their credit scores. They don't have the ability to get out of their situations because 
if your credit score is destroyed, well, now you have to go to like a really crappy car place and get a place that's going to give you a 30% car loan because your credit's bad and then you can't get a house and then you, you can't get a personal loan to like fix it at for a lower interest rate. Like it causes so many problems for people. And I, I hate getting emails and hearing from people who are in so much pain with this high interest debt. A lot of people, again, the, the budgeting and all of that can help prevent it. If you've never had credit card debt and you want to make sure that you never do, just budgeting in like some savings and an emergency fund to kind of you know, make sure that you don't get there is, is a great way to do it. It can be really hard to get out of credit card debt, super hard. Um, I, you know, the first thing is to just to stop using them. And that can be challenging because a lot of people rely on them to supplement their budget. And my solution to everything, which people don't like, because we're the world is apparently anti hustle culture now, which I keep getting that memo, but then I keep telling people to hustle because I don't know any other way to get out of credit card debt than except for working extremely hard and taking on a side job and just busting your butt and selling everything in your house. And just knowing that the pain of three to six months of a second job and the exhaustion that you're going to feel, it's going to be painful either way. You either have the pain of being exhausted and knocking out the debt, or you have the pain of being in the debt and the worry and the ruined credit score. So you have to get rid of it. And there's no, you know, we keep talking like, this is a millennial message. There's no quick fixes to any of it. There's no quick fix to building, becoming wealthy. There's no quick fix to getting a book deal. There's nothing is, nothing worthwhile is quick. And so this credit card debt and a bad credit score, we're talking like a hardcore six to 12 month journey to fix that. And it's totally possible to fix. Lots of people do it all the time. It's just taking the responsibility, doing the extra work, calling the creditors, asking for lower interest rate, asking for them to like freeze the cards. There's a lot of things that can be done, but really hard work is what it comes down to. Yeah. Hard work, smart choices, and for a substantial period of time, sacrifice, right? So when you look at that budget and my wife and I have done this exercise with some family in the past, and you look at the monthly expenditures and you're seeing Tim Hortons or Dunkin' Donuts, if you will, is is I, I think your version of this down in the U.S. And you're seeing it three times a day, and you're saying like, what what are you doing? Like you're you're saying you have money problems, but you're spending twenty bucks a day on like donuts and coffee. Like this makes no sense. Like scratch that sacrifice, right? Like just make some coffee at home for a while. And just know that if you get to a certain point and you get good with money and you start your net worth. You can go to Tim Hortons anytime you want. It like literally won't matter. Yes. Yes. Sacrifice now. Live below your means for a period of time so you can live the way you want for the rest of time. And for the millennials out there, not just millennials because it's everyone, but the millennials are the ones that are coming up right now and in, in getting into the into the financial world and going through what we're talking about. There is no quick fix. There is no quick way to get rich, quick way to get wealthy, quick way to get out of debt. Everyone seems to want to watch a YouTube video on how to be a millionaire overnight. Most of the people that are filming those videos, it is a tremendous amount of work to be one of those people. You do not become an overnight YouTube sensation easily. Those people are killing it. Same with business, the same with weight loss. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to explain how much work goes into like one four minute. <laughs> yeah, you want a big social media following that takes an incredible amount of time, commitment, effort, and one of the key words, consistency. You, you want anything, it's the same recipe. So um, I'll get off that soapbox now and jump on to it but it's people don't like that soapbox i live on that soapbox but it makes people mad <laughs> and then they unfollow and send me mean messages and i'm like all right <laughs> well it's it, it's it's hard for me to get 
onto the box because, you know, I, and I'm learning so much more in life cap, but I basically tick like, you know, eight of the nine privilege boxes. And so I recognize that. And for some of those boxes, the other boxes help contribute to me getting there. And it's everything we, we just talked about hustling for long enough, consistently enough, uh, sacrificing mental, mental, physical, familial health to get to a position where we could pull back and live a more balanced life. But for, for a number of years, there, the sacrifice was massive. And, you know, am I glad I made it? Yeah. Would I have wanted to keep going for more time? Absolutely not. Uh, need that time with the children and with my wife. The So having talked budgeting, we now get to the key to it all. And if you're in the accounting world, you're in the business world, everyone knows that cash is king. So we have our net worth. And to put it into accounting terms for some other accounting geeks out there like me, your net worth is effectively your balance sheet. Your budget is effectively your income statement. And so now the third of the key financial statements is the cash flow. Kat, can you take us through the cash flow, why it's so important, and what some of the key things you look for in the cash flow? And if you want to dive right into it, what are the three anchors that you think people really need to focus on with their cash flow? Yeah, I talk about the three anchors in my book, and it's you know house, car, and food. Those are the three main parts of anyone's budget. The other things, like the Tim Hortons we talked about, all those are very minor uh, compared to the three anchors. And, you know, much like a, an anchor, it can sink you or it can provide a lot of stability to a ship. So when people are in a tight financial spot, when they feel like they can't breathe, it's usually one of those three things that they can address, that they can free up some cash flow. And, you know, we talk about cash flow, it's exactly how it sounds, right? The cash coming in and the cash coming out. And, you know, we talked about a lot of people who get into credit card debt, it's because they're supplementing their cash flow, they don't have the cash to pay for something. So they have to put it on a credit card, and they're waiting to get paid, they're waiting for it to flow in to then take care of that. And so getting on top of the cash flow, getting in charge of it, like becoming like the boss of the cash flow is something I don't think we talk about enough. We talk about budgets exhaustively. We don't talk about how to, you know, increase some of those categories and increase space. So food is the easiest of the three anchors to address, right? It's a high spending category. But if we all put our minds to it, we could have a super cheap food month and free up a ton of cash that could be used to apply to something else. If I wanted to save $2,000 really fast, that's where I would go. The next easiest anchor to address is the car. I have such pet peeves with the car stuff. Again, I could just rant for hours about cars and car payments and just the types of cars that people are driving. But I'm not a car person. Like My husband loves cars. My son loves cars. And I'm just like... I, you know, it's going to have crushed up goldfish in it no matter what I drive. So I really don't care. But, you know, that's just not my, you know, it's not my jam. So I guess it doesn't matter as much to me. But the cars I see for a lot of people, the average car note, I don't know if you read these reports that come out. These are the kind of emails I get. I think we're well above $500 a month for the average car note. Now, the the most popular um, car note, they're getting up to eight years now. It used to be you could only you know, have a car note for five years. Now they allow it up to eight. This is a space where a lot of people can sort of swallow their pride, You know, just pick a different car, drive the minivan you don't want to drive for a year, and you're getting rid of hundreds of dollars in that car note. And then, of course, you know, the, the hardest one to move, especially right now, is the house. That's a hard cash flow to free up because that means you're downsizing, you're selling your house. Super difficult to buy a house in this market right now. So even addressing the food in the car, you could find 
a thousand dollars right there in cash flow that you could divert to high interest debt, whatever else you want to get rid of, or you're finally making your investments and, you know, again, make the cold train go that way. So yeah, that's my, that's the anchors. So any rules that you want listeners to think about when it comes to cars or to the house, like in terms of sizing your purchase relative to your net worth? Yeah, I think a lot, you don't want a car more than your yearly income, I think is a good, you know, if you're making you know, $40,000 a year, probably shouldn't have a $50,000 car. I think that the house, you know, it's kind of good to keep it at 25% of your gross, but preferably your net would be really helpful to only have that be 25%. And uh, your house payment being 25% percent of your no more than that which can be hard in a lot of I know a lot of places a couple of the big cities and things like that or your rent payment you know and then people who live in you know New York San Francisco Toronto you, you might have a house payment or a rent payment that's 45 percent of your take-home pay and that might be like the, the best, safest location that you can have. And maybe you're not even being obnoxious about it. Maybe it's just like a nice, normal spot. But if that is the case and that's where you're choosing to live, then you have to give up some other categories. You know, maybe you don't have a car at all because you live in New York City and you take the subway. And so that can kind of, I always get that pushback whenever I say that. Oh, but I live in XYZ. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, then just don't spend that much in this other spot. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's you raise a very good point. I'm one of those individuals. We live in in Vancouver, which is a very high cost of living. So yes, super expensive. We're probably definitely over twenty five percent for the house, and at the same time, I look at it and say, okay, the interest rates two percent, two point three percent. So that payment, even though it's greater than twenty five percent about 80% of the payment is going to principal pay down. And so I look at that and say, well, that's effectively saving because that's going back into the net worth and we're not touching it. So I like to look at it as a forced saving mechanism versus a poor financial decision. <laughs> a little bit of framing on that one. Okay, so you also have an acronym for cash flow. I think it's roads, but with two S's. Yeah, I gotta remember. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, mm. that one's not stuck in my brain. Oh, yes, I found it. Which I think you've gone through some of these already. So when we're doing it, reper research past spending and bills. So we talked about that. Omit any unnecessary expenses. So what are the easy things to cut out? And for all the listeners out there, I promise that the key to getting wealthy is not skipping avocado toast and coffee. Eat your avocado toast. Enjoy it. Have your coffee. Have your avocado toast. And don't buy an $80,000 car if you're making $50,000. You and I have so many of the same thoughts. <laughs> like, it's not. That's fine. But once you get to a point where you can't afford stuff, it totally loses its what's interesting about it. You know, it's it's not like fancy anymore. It's let's talk about that because that's huge. I actually just moved and it was astonishing to me how many things I sold, how many things I got rid of, how many bags of trash. I honestly think like there's a wealth journey. There's like a minimalism journey and then there's like a health journey. And I think they're all very intimately tied together. It's like the more, the more your wealth grows, like the less you care about the super nice things. People always want what they can't have. Like, you know, I can go out and buy a Louis Vuitton bag. I just, it's not interesting to me at all. Like, you know, there's some people that have, that's their passion, that's their jam. That's fine. But once you get to a point where you can't afford stuff, it totally loses its, 
what's interesting about it. You know, it's, it's not like fancy anymore. It's, it's really, really interesting. I heard Farnoosh Tarawi talking about this one time. She had, she had been uh, contemplating a watch purchase for a long time, a really nice watch purchase. And then she just kind of got to the point where she was like, I mean, I could, but like, now that I can, it's not as exciting anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, yeah. Yeah. It, it was aspirational. And now that I've got there, it's no longer an aspiration. You know, it's just one of those things. So honestly, it, and then when you get kind of like organized with your money and like, you're kind of like doing your food budget, it's like, once you get organized in one aspect, you start to like organize your house and get rid of stuff. And then you start to like get healthier and like, it all kind of comes together like once your mind is free of like the money clutter, then you kind of want your house to be free of it. And that now that you're like organizing on top of things, now you start to have some freed up money and you're like, you know, I could join the gym or I could, you know, buy a set of weights or I could get a trainer or something like that. It's I say sell everything in sight because this Rhodes formula is for when you're trying to shift your bills to a one month ahead system. This is kind of what we were talking about earlier, you know, starting the month with all the money that you need for the month. This is like the formula to like buckle down for a couple months to get there and then stay there. Um, So selling everything in sight is just a way to like make a couple hundred dollars to like add to your balance so that you can start the month. And then I have side hustle temporarily as the last S on there. Um, because that's what you have to do if you want to get one month ahead and free up your mental space so that you can automate your bills without worrying whether or not you have enough money for that. The One of the key things, it sounds like we are even more aligned than some of the stuff we've already been aligned on is you. one of the things I always talk about is if you're growing every day, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and let's say your financial house is in order, just the basics. And then you're tackling those four things and you're ticking the boxes every day on growing. The financial just takes care of itself. And, and it does it in two ways. One, you actually want less. Because once you're, when, when you're mentally and spiritually and physically fit, you, you tend to realize I, I need less things. Like I don't need this. I don't need that to your point about the aspirations, they go away. And the other thing is if you're fit in all of those areas, the money actually comes, right? Because you've effectively adopted an abundance mindset in every area of your life. And you're making yourself a better human every day. And when you do that, people want to pay you for the knowledge you can bring them. Yes, they want to be around you. They want to spend time with you. It's incredible. Yeah. They, they want to be around you. <laughs> yeah. Then they want to pay for your expertise. Yeah, they do. And um, I can think back to some of like some of the worst periods of my life just, and I, and like my house was like always a disaster. Like the, the more like depressed or down or worried about money, you know, just in the thick of it, you know, little babies, just days, days long, just that like everything was a disaster, right? Cause your, your exterior kind of matches your interior or whatever's going on. you you can walk into anyone's house and just being like, this family's stressed, man. Like this family is overwhelmed. You know, this mom doesn't have enough energy. Like she, she wants to have 50% less things in her house, but like, it's like so low on the list. And then some of like, you know, my best times is when I have like things are organized or like, I don't, I could sell this thing, but it's easier for me to drop it off at the thrift store today and then move on to some other task, some money-making task versus I'm not going to coordinate with 12 people to pick up $5 things off my porch. You know, it's like, you know. And it's one of the best things with Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace now is, you know, your kids outgrown their bike. To your point earlier, my wife did this the other day, emotional labor. She just I got to get rid of this bike. She did a ton of research on what used kids' bikes are are worth, and seventy five dollars is the number. So she threw that out and got seventy five bucks for a bike. So, you know, it's there's there's a Sunday, and so it's it definitely helps. And you you'd be surprised at what's laying around. You know, you look around the room and say, "What have I not touched for a year or two? If I haven't, and it doesn't spark joy anymore." 
then it's time to let it go. The So you and I both think people should have a wealth mindset. What are some of the reasoner, reasons that your readers and our listeners have a negative subconscious or in some cases conscious block to money in the pursuit of wealth? Well, I mean, I think it starts really early. You know, I'll sit and watch movies with my kids and the evil character is often rich. They're often this like huge, massive, like, you know, like pointy science lab or something. And they're like ruining the world and they're wearing like suits. And like everyone who's saving the day is like the ragtag team of kids that takes them down or something. But I think this subliminal like messaging goes on and on and on. And I think that people think they want to be wealthy, but their subconscious blocks it because they are worried that if they become wealthy, they will become a bad person, that their friends won't like them anymore, that it's going to change their relationships with their family. Um, I think people have concerns about success because the more money you make, the more they think, you know, oh, well, then I'm going to have to learn about taxes. And then I'm going to have to learn about this. And, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to be one of those like mean, rich people that, you know, whatever. I think that it's like everyone likes the idea of it, but they secretly like are afraid of what will happen to them and their life and their, their friends and family if they actually succeed beyond their wildest dreams. And what, what does that mean for them? So they'd rather not succeed than get there and find out that life is better on the other side. Yeah, I don't even know if they consciously don't succeed, but I do think that that holds them back and creates blocks or like they might not go for it all the way because they're kind of worried about like what will what will happen and what does that mean and like will they be able to handle it? Um, you know, the best thing I can compare it to, I was listening to a talk and they said, you know, everyone wants a million Instagram followers but could you handle if you got a million Instagram followers tomorrow, like, could you handle it? Could you handle like that many people asking you questions? Could you handle that many people doing negative comments or that many people knowing that much information about your life? If you, if that happened overnight, it's like, no, you have to gradually like work your way up to being able to handle that, having a team in place to help you. And I think people just see, Oh, if I was this way, would my friends be jealous if they came over to my beautiful house? Like who would celebrate with me when I finally got my dream car? Like should, should I even post about this trip on Instagram? Cause like, I don't want to make other people, I don't want them to think I'm like bragging or whatever. And uh, it's, it's just like a theory I have that I just think people block themselves from You have to be ready to like shed your current self to become your your next highest self. And I think that's terrifying. In some of the men's work that I do, we talk about the fact that as you evolve and as you grow, there's sometimes a grieving process because you're effectively killing the old version of you because you can't be a new you without the old you dying. It's such a powerful way to look at that process. And, and it may be that some people are afraid to go through that evolution. So they stay the person they've always been, which creates, we talked earlier about a growth mindset, the opposite being a fixed mindset. I'm going to stay the way I am. I'm not going to grow. I'm not going to get outside my box, which feels like a scary place to live. It's not percent. I mean, and, and we're talking about evolution and evolving, you know, and as human beings, you know, we are, our brains and bodies are designed to avoid pain just primitively. Right. And, you know, cavemen are taught, you know, don't run, don't run towards the tiger, right? Like that you will die. Yeah. Like that's our primitive brain and mind. So anytime, and like my husband has experienced this with his work too. Like anytime you do something where you're, you're shedding a former version of yourself, like your whole body and brain are screaming, like, abort mission that is unchartered territory do not do that thing do not do not quit your job do not do that 
that your family will die. Your whole village will be, you know, plundered. And, you know, this is just like our biology just saying, I don't like that. I don't like that. And so you, you can either be a person that's like, nope, don't like it. I'm going to just stay. I like my house. I like my nine to five job. I'm just going to do my thing, watch my football game. Or you can just be like, I am going to go through this incredibly uncomfortable metamorphosis because like I have this gut feeling that this is the right thing for me to do. But yeah, it's, again, it's not easy to become a new version of you. It's not easy to build a company. It's not easy to build wealth. It's super, super hard. That's why there's a small fraction of the population who actually do it and are successful at it. But success does not equal happiness, right? We know this. Yeah, absolutely. No. (laughs) So you just have to be okay with yourself and your decisions along the way and kind of enjoy the ride. Yeah. And the more you want to achieve, the more you want success, the more you have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable, right? It's, you're always going to be uncomfortable if you're growing. That's the fun part of the journey. I think I got knocked on the head in sports too much when I was young. So I don't have that switch that says avoid discomfort. I somehow, I've got that switch that's like, let's always be uncomfortable. And it it makes for, a, to me, a very fun and engaging life. That's why I definitely have the switch. My husband's like way more like pro risk. We should do this, like crazy ideas. And I'm just like, we have to pay on the mortgage. So, okay. But like, I'm, I'm like conservative entrepreneur, I guess, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll go for it. But also I want to make sure everything's taken care of. And he's like, it'll probably be fine. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're like my wife in that way. And, and I sound like your husband because you used the key word. It will probably be fine. And she's like, no, no, no. We need to know it will be fine. Like you need a plan. You need to show me the numbers. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I love that. You have children. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Our, our children will be homeless. I'm like, I don't think that'll happen. I think you're going to extremes here. The So one of the key things that you, you focus on, and, and I'll take you there in a little bit of a segue, I always say the formula for wealth is super simple. Earn more, spend less, invest the rest. You talk about the importance of negotiating as it relates to both steps one, earnings, and step two, spending. Can you take us through that? Because a lot of people do not like to negotiate. So what do they need to learn? I know, I love it. (laughs) Yeah, I I love negotiating. Like I, I love, I think it's because it's confrontational for, or a lot of people perceive that it's confrontational in a negative way. Cause when you negotiate, you gotta really be like up, you know, like with another person. And again, it could be uncomfortable, but my secret to negotiation, I think I mentioned this in the book, was like, I'm just like super nice. (laughs) I'm just like the nicest negotiator ever. And, you know, in the past couple of years, I've worked with a lot of like large businesses and I'm just kind of like a one woman show, but I've gotten used to negotiating and, you know, I just do it in a super nice way. Like, oh, I don't do anything for less than that. Oh, I wish I could. God, I'd love to work with you, but... Gosh, I have it ha- for that time commitment. It has to be something like this. And normally I get what I want. But I always encourage women that they have to get that uncomfortable feeling. Like if they're going to ask for a raise at work, a lot of people who get started in a type of entrepreneurial job where you have to have like clients and you have to negotiate contracts and things like that. I say ask for a number that's really uncomfortable. Like you should not feel good sending that proposal email. You should feel like you want to throw up because you just asked for a number that you don't think you deserve. And now you're super awkwardly going to have to wait a few days to see what they said. And there's nothing that should feel good about hitting send. And like in a negotiation where you're actually getting what you're supposed to be paid. Because again, Women, moms undervalue ourselves, undervalue our time, and undervalue our our skills and expertise. In a in a negotiation, that's what I say. Just make sure you're feeling just real queasy, and you're probably right on the mark in the number you should be asking for. And the same thing with negotiating down your bills. Again, my secret is like I am super nice. Like I promise, 
like the annoying cable company has had no one be nice to them that day. I'm like, oh my gosh, hi. Hey, how are you doing today? Have you had a ton of calls today? Like, look, yeah, like my bill, it just jumped up. I think I'm out of the contract. Like, I'd love to get it marked down. It's like, oh, don't mind my kids in the background. You have kids, you know, <laughs> just like, I am so nice. And again, I usually get what I want. So, but I do think that women should negotiate, especially if they're, you know, working and, and working towards raises. And I think like part of this is like recognizing their power and recognizing all that they, they probably are undervaluing at work what they actually bring to the table and how valuable they are, because that's just for some reason, that's just what we do. So I try to have that empowering chapter because again, the more money you make, the more you can invest, the more of your income you can put into your little work sponsored retirement plan and on and on. The I'll throw two book recommendations out there for the listeners. When you're looking at this, there's a book called The Prosperous Coach by Steve Chandler and Rich Litvin. And they talk about exactly what Kat was talking about. There's a specific number that you work on and it's your uncomfortable number. And so you start to think about, for example, as a coach, what would I want to earn per hour? And whatever that number is that's uncomfortable, you explore why is it uncomfortable and figure out how to push past it and ask what you're truly worth. The second book would be, it's called Existential Kink, and it's a book on shadow work. So it explores your subconscious. And so there's a lot of things that we've been talking about here as it relate to wealth that are subconscious. And she has in her book, a couple great exercises on exploring why you're afraid of wealth and why you're afraid to go after it. There are absolute artwork. And I've, I've used those in group before to help some of the people get through the roadblock of why do I think I'm not worth the money? Largely because you all are worth more than you think you are. So those are two great exercises, two great books to help you get over those roadblocks and so that you're willing to negotiate for the right number. Kat, 15 years apart, you went through two interesting situations that highlighted to you the importance of emergency funds and insurance. Can you share what with our listeners, what were those two situations? And what did they teach you about emergency funds for people who don't know what they are, and how you should size them? Yeah. Um, so I am from South Louisiana. My husband and I are both from South Louisiana, both born and raised there. Um, we live in Detroit now, but we're both Louisiana folk. And we went through Hurricane Katrina. And I was just starting as a freshman in college at Tulane in New Orleans, up, um, where I was going to go to college. And I dropped all my stuff in my dorm room. And then this announcement came on on the day that I moved into my freshman dorm, like the city's evacuating. This time, you guys need to actually leave, <laughs> like, no, take your kids back. And um, so I grew up about 30 minutes from there. So, you know, my um, childhood home, uh, my parents, business, all of that got destroyed in Hurricane Katrina. And there was a, you know, this interesting sort of period where, you know, we could not live in our home, I was supposed to go to college. And, you know, my parents had an emergency fund, they had money saved aside where they could handle a situation like this. Their emergency fund, you know, made the difference in this super critical, unprecedented moment, they were able to move um, their kids to Baton Rouge, to a like bed and breakfast where we lived for a few months. They enrolled me at LSU because Tulane closed for the semester. That's where I met my husband. And my husband was a Hurricane Katrina volunteer and was like helping people like get situated. And that's how I met him. And eventually my parents moved to a little rental house. I mean, it wasn't like great, but there were thousands of people in the Louisiana Superdome who died, who were in horrible conditions. There were thousands of people in shelters with destroyed homes. And because of my parents' emergency fund, even though like everything they had built their whole lives 
their business, their home was gone, they were able to make sure that we were safe and taken care of. And um, it's it's a weird feeling of like dissonance. I kind of talk about in the book, you know, walking outside in the eye of the hurricane um, with my dad and just how eerie it felt because you are, you're in a moment where you know your life's like about to change, but everything's a little bit quiet. Even like once I left school and um, the hurricane wasn't there yet, it had just been upgraded to a category five. So they told everyone to leave, but it was like three days and it was the most beautiful sunny days leading up to Hurricane Katrina hitting. I mean, I had friends over, we were hanging out, playing in the water. And, you know, 15 years later, I just had this like crazy deja vu because I picked up my twins from kindergarten. It was supposed to be their spring break. And their school said, you know, we're probably not going to be coming back after the spring break because of COVID. Like, we're not sure. We'll keep you guys updated. And I just remember I came home and I, they were playing in the backyard and running around screaming. And I had the exact same feeling. Like, this is a beautiful sunny day. My kids are running around. And you know, this thing is coming, but I don't know what it is, but it just took me right back to standing in the eye of the hurricane. It's like 15 years apart. Yeah, just needing the emergency fund, needing to have money in place just in case, you know, my work slowed down significantly because I traveled a lot. I do a lot of public speaking um, during normal times. And a lot of that came to a halt. I became, you know, the little kindergarten Zoom teacher helper. My husband is um, a physician. He was on the front lines for months of COVID. And it was wild. The whole thing was wild. And then I got the book deals. I wrote the book during quarantine. And, um, you know, all in all, I feel like we were in a very like safe position during quarantine because even though my work slowed down, even though my spouse was working a lot on the front lines, I didn't worry if my kids could eat. I didn't worry about paying my mortgage. I didn't worry that, you know, my work had slowed down because in addition to having like a personal savings emergency fund, I also had a, like a business one. I always try to keep like a certain amount in my business account at all times where I can pay myself. Like I think it was like five months at the time um, for five months. And I could take a little step back for a minute and kind of take care of my family. That's what emergency funds do. They, again, we're talking about the mental load and all of that. They make it so that you don't have to panic when the world is panicking. And um, we definitely use that money. I know my parents use that money. I tell my parents a long time to get insurance money, to get like business stop uh, insurance money. It took them a long time to get that stuff sorted out after Katrina, but they had to, you know, have months of money saved up so everybody was taken care of. And, you know, COVID was not near as extreme as that, but it was still the same feeling, right, of just dissonance. Yeah. And for some people it was right. There's some people who, who did lose their jobs and ended up in rough situations. I think both the, both the U S and Canada here stepped in pretty quickly to put in programs for those people to help them through that rough time stimulus checks or, or we have one, I think uh, we called it CERB that helped people who were unemployed for a period of time. So that, that was beneficial, but if they hadn't stepped in, that's where you're saying the importance of the emergency fund is. And based on what you've seen in those two situations, what do you recommend for duration for people to build that emergency fund up to? Gosh, I used to say like three to six months. And now I'm just like, I wish I would have had a year when COVID hit. Like I said, I had like the five months for me for my income. And like, I like to feel like I'm, you know, I like to contribute and at the time, my husband was just in training. So like up until like a month ago, I was the breadwinner for like 10 years. So yeah, I'd like to build it up to a year myself. I'm not quite to a year, just available cash, like not invest, just totally liquid. That's what felt comfortable in the moment. I don't know. <laughs> That's what I kind of said in the book. Like before this, I'd have been like, you know, three to six months, you know, give you some time to figure stuff out, get a different job. And now I'm just like, oh, should we prepare for the apocalypse? Like, I don't know. Again, that's like my conservative, like financial self, like kicking in. Um, so I was, as I was writing the book in quarantine, my feeling was like, we should all have 12 months. Now it's published and stuck that way. But I'm like, maybe, maybe we should like cut the difference. Maybe say nine. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a large amount of cash to be idle, right? It's a lot of cash to just have sitting there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I always look at it and say, could it be lines of credit? Like, can I just have... 
HELOCs or operating lines that I haven't drawn down on. And I had a lot of people read it behind me. I'm like, do I sound like a jerk? Do I sound like I'm like pro working mom or pro stay at home mom? Because I really am like half and half and have always been because I became self-employed in January and gave birth to my twins in March. And so my thought at the time in my, you know, me not knowing what it was like to parent, I was like, you know, I'll just work during that nap and I'm just going to grow my business and I'm just going to make the same amount of money and do my little calls while they sleep. And then, you know, it's like, then I had twins. And then I learned what it was really like that no one told me. So I realized I needed some childcare. So all I could afford at the time, because early in my business, I think I was earning like two, three thousand dollars a month. And so I hired like a mother's helper to come two hours a day. At first, I was just so nervous. Someone else was like taking care of my tiny little babies that I just like just sat there with her. And I was like, you feed that one, I'll feed this one. But then as I grew to trust her, I started working. And then I kind of developed this idea like, you know, reinvest in the babysitter. So if I at the time, you know, I wrote like, one article for $20 or something. And, you know, I paid her, you know, 10 or eight, she was like this 15 year old mother's helper. You know, I would try to write like an article or two, or I would try to sit and pitch and try to get all these new clients. Because early in my business, like all my income was like freelance writing income for financial writing. And uh, if I made more, I would like add an hour. And like every time I like earned more than I was paying her, I'd add time to eventually you know, a year in, I was able to kind of, I guess, upgrade, I don't know if upgrade is the right word, because they're all lovely, but get a a 25 hour a week nanny to come. And so I could have, you know, lunch with them or whatever. But then once she came, I had 25 hours to really knock it out the park. And I still am trying to break this habit, but I still always work after my kids go to bed. I've been doing that so I just like kind of a night owl. So even now that there's seven and I have like the solid business, I'm still like at 1030, like, I don't know, I just kind of get sparkly at that time of day. I'm trying to be normal, but it's not working out. But so I've, but I've never had, you know, full-time childcare. I've always done something, you know, I've always been half stay at home mom, half working mom. And, you know, and then once they started school, they started school. And so I really understand both sides of it like the pressures of the working mom like the pressures of like oh I really want to take that opportunity I really want to go for it what am I gonna do about the kids you know like can I go do that thing can I go speak at that event like that's the highest I've ever been offered to get paid to speak but I'll have to like fly there and like who can can someone watch it for that you know just this whole thing so I understand that pressure of like wanting to succeed wanting to like you know improve the business, make more money, but just feeling like, am I, is this the right thing? Am I like hurting them by working this much? And then you get like the little things like, mom, why are you always on your computer? And it's like, well, (laughs) because I have to be, but then I understand the stay at home mom thing. And like, you know, days where like, I couldn't work because just one or both are just like crying all day. And like, just, you know, the worry of that and like the house not being how you want it and like the whole thing. So I understood like on the days where I was like more stay at home mom, how nice it would have been like a help or have like another person there or things like that. So I wrote this chapter to educate moms on, you know, making the decision if they want to become a stay at home mom or if they want to, you know, if they have a baby, whether or not they want to go back to work, because big pet peeve of mine is when moms say, well, my paycheck is the same amount as daycare, so I'm just going to stay home. And what I wanted to encourage in this book is like, it is more than that one calculation. Again, emotional aside, if we're talking financial, your paycheck likely has a lot more in it than just your net pay that equals the daycare. You know, do you have a retirement match? Do you have health insurance? Do you have, you know, raises that you get every year? How much money would you have had at age 60 if you had worked and gotten your employer match and invested for these five years, like what is the actual total cost of it? And are you able to go down to one income? Because let me tell you, it's not going to be a lot of fun if you go down to one income and all of a sudden you have 
a baby at home. I'm like crying babies. I even have not crying babies because that's all I knew. Can you do a zoo membership? Can you do a museum membership? Can you put them in a cute little baby music class? Or because you went down to the one income and you know you have limited savings because you wanted to stay home, now do you feel financial stress? And so now you're really not having a good time. So there's just a lot, a lot more that that goes into it than just my paycheck equals daycare. Of course, you're Canadian, so you guys have way better, you know, <laughs> way better situation than we have in the U.S. I mean, you're not uh, you're not worried about like the the healthcare costs, and then you have phenomenally better maternity leave policies than we have here in the U.S. I think most women at least take the first year off. I think some now it may have been extended out to 18 months. I forget how exactly that works. And there's an ability for the dad to take some of it or in a same sex relationship for partners to share it. The some people I've seen who are very career oriented, they tend to take some of them take a a shorter one, right? So they may say, Hey, I only want to, you know, I want some, but I want to be back in the office in six months because I love what I do. And, and it's important to me. So some of them, some people will take a shorter period, but it's, it's a pretty good program. I know with, with both our boys, my wife took off the full year, the first year, and then they were in daycare. And we also were able to, and not everyone has this opportunity. My mother-in-law effectively moved so that she could watch our kids every day, right? At some point, we put them in daycare because we we thought, well, you, you need to be socializing with other kids, not just your mother-in-law, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe you should meet another kid. <laughs> yeah, but she would drop them off, pick them up, help us out. So it was absolutely, absolutely a lifesaver. Now, enjoyed the conversation. A lot of great things we covered. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you want the moms that are listening out in the world or anyone that, that you want to want to add? I think, honestly, kudos to you. This has been the most thorough interview I've had during this whole like book tour. And I enjoyed our conversation too. And I think we, we did a lot of step-by-step things. I think if I was to say anything to end it, it'd just be to reiterate to the moms out there that they can absolutely learn anything full stop. Money is just another one of those things. And that they have all the abilities and leadership skills to be more successful than they can possibly imagine listening to this right now. And to kind of like go big and to go for it when it comes to their personal finances. And that you know, if they choose to read this book or request it um, from their library, that I hope it helps them at least get a jump start on that journey. Excellent. And we'll have a link to where they can buy the book in the show notes. Where else can our listeners find you that we'll put in the show notes, Kat? Uh, I'm at uh, katherineolford.com. And there's like a mom's got money starter pack in there. So if you want like a spreadsheet outline or a a little budget template, or even I think I included um, some of my, like my mindset chart of like new thoughts that you can adopt. They're all in there. It's, it's free. It's at the top of my website. And then um, I'm on Instagram at Catherine C. Alford. Excellent. Thank you for joining me today on the pursuit of learning. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on the pursuit of learning. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and head over to our website, thepursuitoflearning.com, where you will find our show notes, transcripts, and more. If you like what you see, sign up for our mailing list. Until next time, your host in learning, Clint Murphy. Clint Murphy.